Back for another edition of In the Huddle. Carl Dukes along with my man Brian Baldinger. Jason Locke on four, part of this podcast as well. And guys, today we're going to take a look at the West, the NFC West, as we continue to break down these divisions. And Baldy, uh, we had a great conversation the other day. You know, I got a lot of response about the Chiefs and the Broncos and all the things we were talking about. Guys, you can always subscribe. We suggest that you do so you don't miss any episodes. You can watch us on YouTube as well at uh, In The Huddle Pod. You can see our faces if you're just getting the audio of this podcast. Check us out and tell your friends about us as well. All right, let's talk about the West, the NFC West. And, Baldy, I got to tell you, I like what Seattle has done. And a few years ago when they traded, you know, Russell Wilson, everybody said, oh, they're crazy. But two things have happened in Seattle that I think has steadied the ship. They've had the same general manager, and they've had the same head coach. And the philosophy on how to win hasn't changed in Seattle. And then, Baldy, you talk about their draft this year. This is an improved team in the West to me. There's no doubt. And if you go back to their last game, which was a playoff loss to the 49ers, that game was a 23-17 game deep into the third quarter, and Seattle was knocking on the 49ers' door when Nick Bosa recovered a fumble from Geno Smith, and the game turned around. But they were going – They San Francisco had their hands full. <clears throat> I think they've gotten better. Jackson Smith and Jigba is an elite talent uh, to go with Tyler Lockett and D.K. Metcalf in the passing game. Um DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett are as good a one-two punch as there is in the NFL. And they have been over the last four years. And it didn't change with Geno Smith because of what you said, the way Pete Carroll wants to play, which is give me two tight ends. Give me three tight ends on the field. Give me Kenneth Walker. Let's run it. Let's pound it. Let's play action pass off it. Um, Let's do those kind of things. They needed to improve on defense. And I think they have. I thought they got the best uh, corner in the draft in Witherspoon. Maybe they got the best receiver in the draft and Jackson Smith and Jigba, we'll find out. Um, You know, they've got a lot of young talent. They get Bobby Wagner back at middle linebacker to go with the guy that he actually groomed in uh, Jordan Brooks. Um, This could be a very, very good team and a real challenger to the 49ers. So can Geno do what he did last year, right? I mean, when you talk about completion percentage, he didn't make mistakes. And that allowed them to be in these positions, to be in ball games and win the games that they did. Uh, Geno Smith surprised a lot of people. And he had probably one of the best quotes that we heard last year. You know, they wrote me off and I didn't write back. But can he do it again, Baldy? That's really the question for Seattle fans, right? Well, he threw 30 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. And he limited to the mistakes. So I remember talking to Gino in training camp. And, you know, there was a quarterback battle going on at that time. And everybody said, oh, they got to go sign Jimmy Garoppolo. They got to go sign Baker Mayfield. Remember all the names? They were like, you know, you got to go fill those shoes of Russell Wilson. And John Schneider, the general manager, and Pete Carroll, like they just were staunch. And I remember asking Gino, do you feel like the organization is behind you? Or is this just a charade? So they find their guy. Mm. And I remember Geno Smith saying, Baldy, I'm just telling you, I've been around. I've been here. I've been in New York. I've been in places. Like, they've got our backs. You know, whoever wins this competition, they're behind us. And sometimes that's what a player needs. You know, the contract, you got the extension. That helps because uh, money talks, as we know. But, you know, it's it's good to just get that reassurance from the head coach. You're our guy. Let's Let's ride. Like that kind of thing. And Gino got that. And then they drafted two two rookie tackles, Big Abe Lucas and Charles Cross. They lined up and played just about every snap last year. And they just they were just really good players. They had a great draft. Kenneth Walker at running back. Um they're just they're just a well-built team. But the good thing is they're a well-built team, exactly what you said, Carl, in the vision of how Pete Carroll wants to play. And remember, there was a lot of friction between Pete and Russell Wilson about how to play. Russell wanted to cook, and Pete's like, we'll get there, but this is what we want to do first. We want to win the line of scrimmage. And, you know, Pete Pete told me this a long time ago, and and I've never forgotten it. Sometimes things just resonate. 
Because they started five rookies last year, Carl, inclu- including T- Tariq Woolen, who was awesome at corner, the rookie tackles, the rookie running back. He said, even he said, going back to my days at USC, I believe in playing young guys. I believe in playing freshmen. And I know we might struggle and we might lose early. But if they're the right guys, we're going to win late. And that's what we saw from these young players last year. And I think you'll see it from these young rookies this year. Like, they might make mistakes early, the rookies. Pete's willing to live with those. If they're the right guys, and I think they are, I mean, this team got better. I think they did too, Baldy. As we talk about the West guys, the NFC West will continue to break things down. How do they split these carries, though, between these running backs, right? They got, I think, McIntosh. You talked about, you know, Walker. Uh, is this going to be a 50-50 backfield, or does somebody you think, you know, emerge as the guy? Well, they also drafted Zach Charbonnet. Like I had him right. as the second best running back in the draft. You know, he Charbonnet was originally a Michigan Wolverine, played there, ended up transferring, went with Chip Kelly to UCLA, and had two awesome years. I mean, he's a big back, and, and Pete likes big backs. He's 225 pounds. I think Kenneth Walker is running back number one. But, you know, as we've seen, I mean, once you start getting, even in today's game, you, once you start getting north of 250 carries, like – Guys are going to get worn down, and they're not going to have a long shelf life. And I don't care who they are outside of maybe Nick Chubb in this business or Derrick Henry. There's a couple. But I think, you know, you're going to get 500 carries out of these backs. And so maybe Mm -hmm. Kenneth Walker gets 250, maybe McIntosh, Charbonnet. Maybe they, depending on how they hold on to the ball, protect, you know, um, how quickly they can kind of read um, the line of scrimmage. Um, I I think they've got a good young stable of backs. This is a team that was second in the NFC West, guys. And you look at their schedule, um, and and we always talk about how scheduling plays out, whether you're finishing the season, how you start. But I just want you to think about this. Starting on November 23rd for the Seahawks, you got the 49ers at home, and then you got to go to the Cowboys. Then you come back. And you're at the 49ers within a three-week period. And then you've got the Eagles. So not to include to end the season with the Steelers, who may be on the come, we'll see, Titans. I think that last portion of this schedule, Baldy, is going to be daunting for Seattle. But if they're able to maneuver it, they could be right back in the playoffs. So here's the key, really. I mean, the schedule is the schedule. Nobody knows who's available at that point of the season. Obviously, you know, on paper here on June 29th, Carl, it's formal. <laughs> the key in all these games, honestly, and it sounds so simple, is just taking care of the football. If Seattle takes care of the football, they'll be in every one of those games. And they have a chance to win a, a lot of those games. I mean, it just comes down to turnover ratio. And the Cowboys yep. are taking the ball away better and more frequently than any team in this league by a wide margin over the last two years. I think over five or six takeaways more than the New England Patriots. So really, and that's what Pete wants to do when he runs the ball. He doesn't want to give it up. He wants to take care of it, wants to protect his quarterback, limit the interceptions and the turnovers. And they did that to a large degree. And if they do that and do it even better and take the ball away, I think they had 25 takeaways last year, Carl. If you get up to around 30, you're going to be at at the top of the leaderboard, at or near the top of the leaderboard, if you can get 30 takeaways. And I think the pass rush will be better. Bobby Wagner is going to help settle guys down, get them lined up better. Brooks is coming back from a torn, you know, uh, knee ligament. Like, you take care of the football. It's it, it's amazing at how many games you are in and how many upsets you can have. By the way, Seattle, eight and a half over-under wins. Win total. Vegas thinks eight and a half over-under. Kind of an interesting number considering we'll talk about the 49ers at ten and a half. And then everybody else is is kind of mediocre. Uh, it is Brian Baldinger, Carl Dukes, In the Huddle, guys. Subscribe, like us, watch us on YouTube again at In the Huddle Pod. You can subscribe there and check out all the podcasts as we do all things NFL. And as we gear up for training camp, we'll be going around to different camps, talking to folks, and also getting you ready for the upcoming season. All right, Baldy, let's talk about uh, Sean McVay. He didn't forget how to coach. But last year, they took a step back. And, you know, he's still got some very talented players on that team. Obviously, Aaron Donald, um, Matthew Stafford's coming back off the injury. 
But I don't know if this window has closed for this particular group. They did what they wanted to do, right? Les Snead went out and said, blank those picks, and they got a Super Bowl. But now they're trying to retool while trying to stay good. And I don't know if you can do that when you're trading away guys that can still play like they've done, Baldy. I think um, I had a, a – there was a, a quote yesterday uh, by a, a, a former GM of, of this league, prominent GM, and he said, would you rather win a Super Bowl or would you rather be highly competitive for 10 years and never win one? Ooh. Like the Rams went for it and they got a Super Bowl. So they try to come back, you know, run it back. And as, soon, as soon as the parade was out there, they're all – from the microphone, they got the Lombardi Trophy, and you know they're on some float in downtown Los Angeles and praying, <laughs> like let's run it back. Okay, well uh, everybody wants to, the Eagle, you know, the, the the Chiefs want to run it back. Everybody wants to. Nobody's done it since New England did it in 0304. It's tough. And then when you lose Matt Stafford, <laughs> when you lose the best receiver in football from the year prior, you lose Aaron Donald. Um, you know, it, it fell apart. And, you know, the, the offensive line fell apart before the season even began. And the guy that was coaching that offensive line, Kevin Carberry, for us, you know, for a Super Bowl championship team, they fired him. They fired him after the the, t- the league, the, the offensive line fell apart. They lost Joe Nopum. They lost Bruss. Like, they lost one guy after another. And so if you said to me, okay, let's go get Cooper Cup back. Let's get a healthy Stafford. Let's get a healthy Aaron Donald. Let's keep the offensive line healthy so Sean can at least protect his quarterback and have a chance to run Cam Akers and a variety of backs. Like, I think they're going to be a lot better. The, con- the connection between Cooper Cup and Matt Stafford was second to none. Like, third downs, red zone, big plays, playoff games against Tampa. Here comes 25 seconds to go in the game. Here goes Cooper Cup down the middle of the field against a zero blitz, and Stafford put it right on. They kick a field goal, win the game. Like, they didn't have that last year for much of the year. I, I think if this offense line stays together, I think they're going to be better than what people want to give them credit for right now. Baldy, they didn't have any first round picks because of all the moves that they've made over the last few years, but they had a lot of picks. I mean, it started with the a second rounder, then they had two threes, they had a four, they had four fives, they had three sixes and three seven round picks. So they don't have that glaring, hey, we got our first-round guy. He's going to come in immediately and help us. But they picked a lot of guys. I mean, this is a numbers game for the Rams right now with the amount of guys that they ended up picking in this draft. Well, you know, they ended up, you know, drafting a player a couple years ago, Nick Scott, at a Penn State safety. And I don't know if they won a Super Bowl without Nick Scott. Now, he's Mm. gone. You know, he, he, he left be a free agency. And so, you know, but they, they, they drafted Nick in either the sixth or seventh round out of Penn state. Like, you know, they've never had, I don't know how far back you got to go. I, 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 like I know in the last 10 years, for sure, they've never spent a number one pick on an offense line. Like there's some offense line coaches. I know that have come through there and they're like, well, we never get, you know, the chance to draft Paris Johnson, you know, or one of these young studs, you know, Darnell, Wright. We, we never get that. We get Rob Havenstein in the second round of Wisconsin, really good player. You know, we get Joe Noteboom in the second or third round of TCU, might be a good player, he's got to stay healthy. Like, that's what they get to work with because of that. And so it's a philosophy. Um, Les Snead is, you know, he's no dumb. He's been around this business a long time. The owner's not obviously afraid to spend money. The coach is an expensive ticket, but he's worth it. Um, yeah. You know, you went got Jalen Ramsey for, you know, some number one picks. Turned out to be a pretty good deal, you know. So, you know, they've lost some really good coaches. The the been a coaching drain out of that. Kevin O'Connell, you know, I mean, go through all the different guys that they've lost. Brandon Staley, they've lost a lot of good coaches. And sometimes it's harder to replace good coaches than it is great players. And they've had to deal with that, you know, as a Ram staff. So they're up against it, but I think they're going to be better than what people want to give them credit for right now, just because. The coach is really, really good, and they did get the injury bug last year at a lot of key positions and key players, and I would think that a lot of those guys are going to be back and healthy this year. 
Yeah, listen, Sean McVay is a guy uh, I have an enormous amount of respect for. He's one of the funnest guys to talk to in the league, Baldy. You know this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and <laughs> he's one of these guys that when you talk to his players, you you guys, you, you get why. He's just cool, laid back, has fun. He gets guys, you know. and He's got and command, he's got Paul. The guy has yes. complete command. If he was yes. running, I don't know, if he, if he was running, you know, uh, Tesla right now, like he'd run Tesla, like they'd be profitable. No offense, Elon, but like he he would be successful. You know, I mean, he just had a commanding presence of how he speaks, his knowledge, and how to get through and connect with people. Yeah, I uh, I just you know, there's something about him, and then he's got he's got that raspy voice, that thing right here where he's always you know, and he's and he's always his memory is incredible too, Baldy. His memory is stupid. Like, yeah. you know, he's like, yeah, it was third and two, uh, fourth quarter. And he starts telling you all this. And you're like, how the hell you remember that? And I can't remember like last four week. years. That's like four years ago. Like they've done, <laughs> yeah. the, they've done the, you know, the, the, the games with them. And like, it's the recall button is, is amazing. It's crazy. And that's, you know, the, the great coaches and great players have that. Uh, they have that affinity. I know guys that literally had to relearn the offense every single year they came back to minicamp. That are like, what's slant 24? What do I do? <laughs> like, I mean, that, there's, there's some guys like that. There, it's, it's not a question of really even intelligence. It's just the way guys' minds are, are wired. And the way Sean McVay's mind is wired is it's like it's just you, you cut open the brain, you know, and dissect it, and it's just a big football in there. Rams six and a half over under according to Vegas guys. This was a five win football team last year. I'm with Baldy. They're going to be better. How much better? I don't know because I do think Seattle and San Francisco are better. Uh, the Cardinals we'll talk about here in a second. They've got some work to do. It's Carl Dukes along with Brian Baldinger. Of course, Jason Lock on four, part of this podcast as well. Guys, subscribe, like us, and watch us on YouTube again in the huddle pod. Check us out as we put new episodes out. All right. So Seattle improved. Rams improve. We don't know how much, by how much, but they'll be better than I think five wins. That's where I'm at right now. But the Cardinals, Jonathan Gannon's got work to do, and he will start the season without his quarterback and Kyler Murray. But I, I look at this team and I, I'm looking at the roster, Baldy, and I'm saying, okay, they got a lot of, they got a lot of works, man. Um, where are they good? Right, D Hop's gone. Wait, where is this team in my, you know, in your in your opinion, where are they good? Because I'm looking and without Kyler Murray running around and making the plays that he can make with his feet, what is it that the Cardinals are going to be good at? And you say, hey, that's something Jonathan can build on. Well, I think they got a great tandem of safeties in Buda Baker and Jalen Thompson. I think those two guys are really solid players. They went and got themselves a solid player. They traded, they traded down from three to twelve. Traded back up from twelve to six to get Paris Johnson um, at yeah. Ohio State. He's a he's a. I had him on my on total access yesterday. Did a breakdown with him. He's a really bright kid. Um, he's played guard. He's going to play guard next to DJ Humphreys. I think you know if you just look at what Monty Osafort did, um, and there's a nice little YouTube thing about making those trades under on the clock with real tension and watched how he operate. Like the guy's a a, a good thinker on his feet. Um, Jonathan Gannon comes in like, you know, they, they, they did what you should do. They addressed <laughs> the trenches, Paris Johnson, BJ Ojolari, like they yep. need pass rushers. They need to, to strengthen the offensive line. You know, you put Kelvin Beecham and Will Hernandez and, you know, you put Paris Johnson, DJ Humphreys, Zach Ertz, you, you start to get like a blueprint about how to build this thing and you build it in the trenches. And so that's where they're at right now. Now, I don't know what Kyler Murray's going to be like. I know Jonathan Gannon pretty good, though, from his days in Philly. And, you know, Jonathan Gannon used to tell me he used to play this game in um, in Philadelphia with his players, and it's called Effort Roulette. You pick a play, any play, and you call out a player's name, and the player coaches all the other 10 players on the field that play, and he gives them an effort grade. Peer pressure. You don't want to be that guy that somebody else is calling you out on. Like you got yep. to get across the field. You got to get to the ball. And you know, and they charted it. And I just think like it's a it's a gimmick. A lot of coaches have things like that, but it kind of says a little bit about Jonathan. Like, this is as 
This defense, this team is as good as the players want to make it. So empower the players, Carl, right? You you know, right. everybody, good coaches do this in a variety of different ways. So like, I think what Jonathan Gannon is going to do is like, look, nobody's counting on us to do anything. Everybody's writing us off. Everybody thinks we're just going to tank to go get Caleb Williams next year. And they might, they might do that. It might happen. Um, but I'm sure Kyler Murray's hearing all about it. And I know this. Jonathan Gannon was in that building at NovaCare in Philadelphia every day that Jalen Hurts was there. He saw Jalen Hurts go from a second-round pick that everybody said he can't play. He can't play at this level. He's strictly a college quarterback. He's a running quarterback. He's not going to make it. Well, nobody has probably improved more at any position in this league since they've come into the league than Jalen Hurts. And he did it because he's coachable, the work ethic is supreme, and he's committed. Now, if I'm Jonathan Gannon, I'm sitting down with Kyler Murray. And I'm just telling him what it's like to work with Jalen Hurts and go up mm. against him in practice every day. And I don't know that Kyler needs that message or he's going to get moved by that message, but I deliver the message to him. Well, would too. Um, and you just never know how you connect to guys, right? Everybody is putting this on Kyler Murray. I know I've been critical baldy of Kyler from the standpoint of just a leadership thing, right? And, and, are you doing, listen, you can make plays. The kid is, he's a playmaker. There's no, he's been that since the first time we saw him in, you know, high school in Texas, but are you a leader? And that is the next step for him to take, to lead this Cardinals team and have guys buy in and believe in him, not doubting him. And, and Baldy, let's be honest. This has nothing to do with Jonathan Gannon, but he can't have that crap that happened with Cliff Kingsbury where the quarterback is yelling at the head coach and it's public and it's it looks nasty and the perception is there's a problem you, you just you know so to your point about relationship building i'm curious to see what gannon does and by the way Kyler murray is going to be back guys we just don't know what that timetable looks like right now he won't start the season but if you're going to have any shot that connection between those two guys has got to be on point it does uh you know and i like I'm, I'm out here to bash Kyler Murray. When him and Cliff Kingsbury came to Arizona, they were three and thirteen. They were the worst offense in football in every category. They were thirty second in almost every single category in football. And you know they, in, for the first three years, they progressed every year to the point where they went and played a playoff game. They got smoked in it, but they made the playoffs. And then last year, it just all crashed. And um, and so you know, and it it, it collapsed bad. And so this right. is after they gave the coach, the general manager, the quarterback extensions, and they just said, enough, let's clean house. Let's start fresh. That's, you know, that's, you know, that's a credit, I think, to the ownership, you know, uh, Mr. Bidwell, um, that he, he just saw that this thing is not going to work long term. You're not going to compete with the 49ers, Seattle, with what they have and what the Rams just did. So uh, there was there was a steady arc of improvement for three years to the point where they were a top 10 offense. And then it collapsed. So they got to get back. They got to start square one right here. But, you know, the talk out there is why even try this year? Just get Caleb Williams next year and let's build around him. And there was mm. some Andrew Luck. And, you know, we've heard all this stuff. Yeah. And I got to tell you, like, there's, I, you know, I mean, Kyler Murray might be a Pro Bowl quarterback this year when he gets healthy and play at that level. But it'd be hard if you get a chance to draft Caleb Williams. To pass it up. It'd be hard to pass up. It just would. Yeah. No, listen, he's next level. Uh, guys, you know, we're a long way away. We just got past the draft here a few months ago, but he's going to be on top of everybody's draft board uh, come next season. All right, we're talking about the West, the NFC West. And by the way, over or under, four and a half for the Arizona Cardinals. That's tough. Uh, but again, new coach, new, new guys, uh, and, and they are climbing this hill that uh, is the NFC West right now with, with 49ers, the, the Seahawks, and the Rams. All right, let's talk about the Se uh, the uh, the 49ers here, last but not least, Baldy, as we talk about this division. And, guys, we're going to go around each and every division. We're going to talk in depth about them. We'll get into some teams more than others. Uh, but the 49ers are a Super Bowl-quality football team. The crazy thing, Baldy, is it doesn't seem like it matters who the quarterback is. <laughs> because they threw they threw a guy in there that we didn't think was going to do anything, and the kid, you know, lost one game, and he lost the game 
you know, he lost in the playoffs because, hell, his arm was falling off. So I don't know if I look at the 49ers any differently than I did last year, which was coming into the season and saying, this is a team that has the ability to get to a Super Bowl. The defense, Baldy, is silly. It is. They probably have the best tandem of linebackers in football. When you look at Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw and how they play together, they're an elite tandem. You look at the development of uh, Talanoa Hufanga, you know, what he's done in safety from a fifth round pick to being a Pro Bowl player. Uh, the the addition of Javon Hargrave cannot be overstated in what he I agree. is going to bring and line up next to Nick Bosa, the reigning defensive player of the year. He might win the award again. Um, I'm anxious to watch uh, Drake Jackson, you know, at defensive end, their second round pick a year ago, because I think he's got elite athletic ability. And now he's going to get a chance to start Eric Armstead. Like they're, they're loaded. They're loaded on that side of the ball. They're the number one defensive football. Um, you know, the Cowboys didn't score a touchdown. Carl, they didn't score a touchdown in the playoff loss. Like they didn't give up a touchdown. Um, and that's a healthy Cowboys team. They, they, they didn't let them in the end zone. You're going to win a lot of games, a lot of playoff games when you don't surrender a touchdown. So Brock Purdy was awesome. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to like, you know, counting the playoffs, he was 16 touchdowns, four interceptions, but more importantly, guys like George Kittle, seven touchdown catches in his limited play with Brock Purdy. Seven of his 11 came from Brock. But everybody everybody got fed. McCaffrey, Ayuk had his first 1,000-yard season. Debo came back from injury. Um, you know, they they were dynamic. They have a, one big hole to fill at right tackle. Colton McKivitz and Matt Pryor, who they signed in free agency, going to battle it out at right tackle. And I've talked to some of those guys. You, you kind of got to know how to run left and run right. It's kind of what they do, you know, and yeah. they, they run the outside zone stretch. They run it as well as anybody. It's coached really well. Um, you know, this, this has a chance to be a special team. Like they got to go do it. Nobody's just going to anoint them. They're not going to just put them on the mantle in Las Vegas in February and say, go, you know, go win a Super Bowl. They got to go do it. Um, well, I, I think the battle at quarterback, honestly, from what everything everything I heard, Brock Purdy is on schedule or ahead of schedule. He's now throwing with his yeah. quarterback coach. You're not going to put him out there to throw with a coach and working on techniques, fundamentals, if you can't throw. So it looks like he's going to be ready to go. To me, the, the the battle is for the backup quarterback job between Trey Lance, you know, and Sam Darnold. And people go, well, yeah. why is there a battle? Why why is it Trey Lance the quarterback? Well. You know, he started four games. He's thrown 100 passes in his career in two years. Like, he just hasn't been available. And I'm not here to knock Trey Lance. I like him personally. Um, and, I, and I'd and i like to see him compete. But I think Sam Darnold is, is going to compete too. And so we have seen in San Francisco, Lord knows we have seen, you better get your backup quarterback ready to play. You just better. For whatever reason, like that position has been hammered over ever since Kyle's been there. And so – you better get yourself a really ready to play number two quarterback, whoever that's going to be. Baldy, the team, this team, the 49ers gave up 16 points a game. That's in the NFL. It's incredible. You said it first overall in that category. You know who's underrated on this team? Kyle Juszczyk, right? The fullback. We hardly ever talk about fullbacks at all in the NFL. And you talk about that run game, and Kyle's just leading the way, right? He's just blowing guys up and creating these holes. And we don't hardly ever talk about these kind of guys anymore. And here Kyle Shanahan is with the best fullback in the NFL. Well, you know, the first guy he's Kyle signed and John Lynch signed when he became the head coach was to go pluck Kyle Duszczyk from the Baltimore Ravens. It made him the highest paid fullback. I don't know if he still is. But um, I remember I did a breakdown – one Sunday, Carl, and it was it was pretty extensive, and it was on Kyle Juszczyk and all the things he did without ever touching the ball, not <laughs> carrying it once and not yeah. touching a ball, never touched the ball in a game, but was as valuable as any player in offense. Now, he can catch it, and he can run it, but there are two-back systems. You know, you, you, you start breaking down teams. You, you start with, are they a one-back team or are they a two-back team? Are they 12 personnel, 11 personnel, 21 personnel? Like you just start with the basics of what they are. They're a two-back offense. And Kyle's ability 
to run every single run, windback plays, counter plays, uh, lead block plays, ISO plays, um, the ability to go out and run routes to stretch defenses, pick up, you know, protection. Like he has, he wears a lot of different hats and he loves his role. He's one guy in this entire industry that will never, ever, ever complain about not touching the ball. Like you're never going to hear him. <laughs> but if, if they want him to go give you 12 good lead blocks in a game, he'll get to give you a good 12 lead blocks. 13 and four, the 49ers last year. We know what happened in the playoffs, but I expect them to be right back in the mix. The personnel is there. The culture's there. Baldy said it. If, in fact, the quarterback is back on pace to be ready for the start of the season, everything just lines up for them to, to be back in this mix. And as we talk about the West as a whole, the pecking order for me, 49ers, Seahawks, Rams, Arizona, and again, that's based on last season, but I don't think that necessarily changes. Could the Rams win more games? Yes. Could Arizona win more than four games than they did last year? Yes. But I still think the pecking order is the same. And this could come down to, by the way, guys, Seattle, if they're playing as well as we think they can, winning these division games and setting themselves up to not maybe win the division, but get back in the playoffs as they did last year, Baldy. I, I could see another playoff game between San Francisco and Seattle. I could see that yes. playing out. Uh, right now. Now, you see, I, I mean, San Francisco would love to get the number one seed and not have to play wild card weekend. I'm sure that's in the back of <clears throat> some people's minds, that organization. But, you know, you start thinking about that, you know, midseason, you know, when you start looking for things to play for, you might have a good record. And then you're like, let's be the number one seed. I, I would say this. I would say the one guy on that whole team, though, that is indispensable is Trent Williams at left tackle. Like, he's just oh, yeah. that good. You know, he got the Madden, Madden rating of 99, all the kind of stuff, you know. Like, players pay attention to that stuff. But, like, Trent, <laughs> it's just, he's just that good. And he changes yeah. the game with his protection. You want to put Micah Parsons on him out there, Trent's going to, like, you know, he's going to calm him down. Run game, you're going to run behind him. Want to, you, you want to pull him and get him in space. Nobody's going to stay in front of him. And he's just indispensable. And so – that's one guy, and, you know, I talked to some friends of mine that are in that organization, like Trent's not being asked to do anything in the OTAs. He's not going to be asked to do anything in training camp. Get him Yeah, we up. know. <laughs> you know, get him, he, knows what, he knows what he has to do at this stage yeah. of his career. Get ready to go play, you know, 20 games this year. Start 20 games at left tackle. Well, it's going to be interesting. <clears throat> By the way, San Francisco, 10 and a half, if I didn't mention that, 10 and a half over under. I'm going over, guys. Oh, yeah. I, I am. I, I, ten and a half. I know it sounds crazy, but I, I'm going over on that number because this team, too. again, is uh, is that talented. Baldy, um, we're going to continue to break down these divisions and talk about them, guys. And, and again, once we get to camp, we'll know and have a, a better perspective of things as things start to shake out. And we'll be getting in more in depth into the team specifically before we start the season. But we're just kind of talking about these divisions. And it's fun because, as Baldy said, we're sitting here in late June, early July. A lot of stuff changes, man. Yeah. Once we get rolling, a lot of stuff changes. So that's what's beautiful about the NFL. Again, subscribe in the huddle, in the huddle pod on YouTube. Check us out there. Tell your friends. And uh, we appreciate all the support, man. We're enjoying it, having a lot of fun. And you guys have made us one of the top podcasts in the Odyssey family. So thank you guys for checking us out and, and being a part of this. Um, we'll get back to this next week. We'll do two different divisions on Tuesday and then uh, another one on Thursday. And we're going to make our way until start of training camp. Yesterday, Baldy, I saw rookies report on the 19th for a lot of teams in July. That's like three weeks, you know? Give me here before we know it, Carl. Be hard. We'll be in training camp. Before we know, the Jets in Cleveland, they play a Hall of Fame game. All the rookies will be in by July 19th for sure. They play that game August 3rd. You know, first game of the year in Canton, Hall of Fame game, um, August 3rd. So it's – we're a month away, Carl. Here we are. Yeah. All right, guys. Enjoy the weekend. Uh, happy 4th of July and all of those things. I know next week it will depend on schedules, but we'll have two podcasts out for you guys to check out. Enjoy, everybody. Be safe, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Carl.